from the Catholic underground. Today on the show, we look back at the top 10 stories of 2013, our picks of the week, and so much more. As usual, the Catholic underground starts now. Alrighty, it's time for the Catholic Underground, your weekly Catholic guide to the digital continent. It's episode number 250. Ha! I'm Father Chris Decker. You're listening live with us. You can get your chat on at catholicunderground.tv. A special welcome to those of you who are watching us on YouTube live on our CU TV stream. Joining me this week, we got Father Ryan Humphreys. He is the rector of the Minor Basilica of the Immaculate Conception in historic Natchitoches, Louisiana. He wears a funny cape these days. Hello, Father. Yes, I do. Hello, Father. <laughs> Hello, work. Unapologetically, I might add. Also, Kathleen Lee, she's a teacher at St. Joseph's Academy in Baton Rouge. She's our licensed faith ninja, and she's getting ready for the Christmas break. Hello, Kathleen. Hey, how are you? I bet you're ready. Oh, so ready. Yeah, and also uh, we got uh, Mary-Kate Taylor, who is in the uh, the video cave. It's not decorated for Christmas yet. Maybe we'll put some red uh, put blinky some lights, lights in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that would be good. Hello to you, Mary Kate. And of course, uh, we have you, you, our listeners, you who are watching us on CU TV. Uh, as always, we can't do what we do without you. And maybe it's just because of the end of the year. We get a little nostalgic, and um, and it just makes me think uh, how, how far we've come, how far you've allowed us to go. And um, I thank you for your patronage and for your listening. And so we thought that we would uh, take a stroll through the top 10 stories of 2013. 2013 was quite a year. And uh, really, Father Ryan, I I think for us as Catholics, for for we who who profess the faith, this was kind of a poster year, kind of an unexpected year, because uh, Pope Benedict the 16th, very early in the year, resigned. Yeah, I mean, as as younger Catholics, remember that all we've ever known were were Pope John Paul and then Pope Benedict. And uh, Pope John Paul, of course, was elected in 1978. And so if you're 35 years old or younger, you've never known anything else. And so here, Pope Benedict, who seems to be doing fine, seems to be in fairly good health, doesn't doesn't really look all that bad up and just resigns. And all of a sudden, yeah. you know, everybody's going, what, 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 what just happened? What's going on? Um, and for me, I know within my own heart, it was difficult because, you know, I having just the connection with John Paul, they were both so very close to one another, John Paul and Benedict, that switching uh, to a new Pope almost felt like, you know, John Paul and Benedict felt like kindred spirits. Yeah. And it was extremely jarring for me. And I felt like it's almost becoming ordinary now mm-hmm. to have a new Pope. You know, there, there's just a sense of like, well, our pastor got moved again. And, yeah. you know, and that it was very, very difficult for me to endure. And of course, I think a lot of people felt the same way. And of course, Pope Francis was so very different than Pope Benedict in a lot of good and, you know, in some certainly some some not good ways. And, you know, what do you do? How do you deal? And of course, we're still getting to know Pope Francis. Right. Um, and of course, he had he had an interview this morning that was just wonderful, you know, and I'm I'm really developing a, a fondness for him. But wow. I mean, what a what an oh, my God kind of moment to have a, a pope resign first yeah. time in a lot of years and then to have a new pope elected. Uh, under such odd circumstances. It's funny because normally whenever you speak to somebody who, um, like like I know, Father, when we do nursing home ministry and things like that, we, we go in and, and one of the first things that, that people in the nursing home love to say is, you know, I've been around for eight popes now. Eight. <laughs> we're almost halfway there and we're not even 40 yet, Father. <laughs> I you know. know. Don't remind I mean, me. My golly. back hurts, Father. It hurts. <laughs> even more with each pope. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Kathleen, where were you? When uh, you got news that Pope Benedict had resigned, I was a, I was, I think I was at school. Mm-hmm. Um, it, we they just kind of been talking about it, and I was like, wait, I'm I am not a a, a fan of change, um, at all. Um, so when when uh, Pope John Paul II died, I was I was like, Ugh. distraught. Yeah, because he was the only pope that I had known. Um, That's why they called him Kathleen's Pope. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. was. He he is. Um, but. You know, I had just kind of been getting used to this new. It takes me a while to get used to change, so I just kind of gotten used to it. And I was like, "No, no, I'm gonna have to look. We're gonna have to send him a letter and say, too bad, so sad. You better <laughs> get back to work, sir.' Um, but uh, you know, mm-hmm. 
it, it had to be. And I yeah. understood it. Like it, I was, it was an interesting, you know, then to be able to look at the two popes, uh, Pope John Paul II and Pope Benedict and how they, uh, how they both exited the office. Right. And what it meant was very interesting. And yeah, we I, talked about that on the show Yeah, before. I think that's one of the things that, that uh, Father Ryan and I kind of processed because I was actually at your house, Father. That's uh, right. It was completely odd. I was, I was just getting up and reading the morning news, and I, I read a lot of news, and I had come across nothing. And then Father Chris throws open the door, slams in with his laptop, and goes, <laughs> the Pope resigned. Yeah. Actually, I think I said something effective. You better get your news feeds working <laughs> because we're going to have a busy day. The Pope resigned. And, uh, and, and you, Father, you didn't believe me. <laughs> no, I said, yeah, right. You must be reading some ridiculous tweet. Because at the time, there had been a couple of people who, who uh, on Twitter had, had supposedly died, and it turns out it was just a fantasy yeah. or it was just a, a prank. And I said, are you sure it's not a hoax? Where are you reading this from? Where are you getting this? And like Lucy from the Chronicles of Narnia, I said, it's not a hoax. <laughs> and then uh, we actually, it was, it was one of my buddies up in Canada, uh, the CU's own uh, Roberto Verri. Mm whom you get from time to time here on the show, he broke the news to me. And, um, I, yeah, it was really surprising. And, and so, Father, we spent the day, in fact, you can look back in our archives at the CU, um, probably you can still measure our shock as we did a special on the resignation of Pope Francis. I'm sorry, I'm a Pope Benedict. Sorry, oops, no. Yeah. Did I let, a, let, did I let slip a Freudian? That, no, um, the resignation of, of Pope Benedict, and it really was, was jarring for both of us. We were trying to figure it out the whole day. Yeah, it, it was, I mean, it, we, we obviously spent a lot of time talking with people and thinking about it, but it, it was completely, we had nothing. We had no idea what to say. We had no idea to know what, what would happen. Of course, we all assumed Pope Benedict was in very, very ill health, and now right. we're coming up on six months, and it turns out that his health seems to be fine. Yeah, I mean, he's got a few fresh liver spots, but why wouldn't you uh, as you as you get older, <laughs> you know? Sure, sure, <laughs> and uh, you know it, it was just it was just such a, a, an amazing moment. Of course, it, it was one of those moments like nine eleven or when John Kennedy was shot, where you say, I, "I'm always going to remember where I was and what was going on," because it was so completely unnerving. That's right, and it may very well be we, the, one of the things that that the, the media began to talk about was is Pope Benedict setting a precedence mm -hmm. for for popes? Because as you said, Kathleen John Paul II, he was such a a, a prolific sufferer. He, he was a yeah. professional yeah. sufferer by the end of his life, and, and that was how he chose to show the world the end of his pontificate. And uh, Benedict, um, Benedict really, it, it's not that he, he wasn't a professional sufferer, because all popes know the cross, we know that. But he simply said, nope, the Lord kind of placed it on my heart, and I'm going to listen. Yeah. And the, the question was, of course, now, is this going to be a precedent? But it, it could be worth saying, Father, this could be the only pope we ever see resign in our lifetime. Oh, of course. I mean— uh, the thing about the, the person who is the right person to be a pope is that he's not somebody who is lacking in confidence or surety in the Lord. Yeah. You know, and so I, I have a very hard time believing that Pope Francis is so insecure. He goes, oh, well, my, if Benedict resigned, maybe I have to as well. You yeah. know, I, I, I think that's, that's just not a reality. And, yeah. and, hey, it may be it may be a precedent for some people. Right. Um, but, I mean, you have to hope and you have to pray that with all the grace that's being flooded into the pontifical apartment, yeah. that, that the Pope is hearing the voice of God and saying, God, what do you want me to do? Not Correct. what seems good for me, not what has been done by my predecessors, but what do you want me to do? Right, exactly. And, and that, of course, is the mark of, of any good Pope is, is one who, who is in union with the Lord. Pope Benedict listened, and it seems as if Pope Francis is, is listening, too. Father Ryan, we also remember where we were when Pope Francis was elected, too. Boy, do I. <laughs> we happened to be in the same vehicle. We were driving back from Austin from uh, our event there with the folks from Austin Catholic New Media on, uh, during South by Southwest. And um, Kathleen, where were you? Were you at school? I was at school. and you know, Did you watch on TV? We did, and it was so funny because everybody was trying to get on. Oh, on, and so our on network was, I mean, it was kept slammed. freezing and, you know, the little dialy thing kept coming and I was stuck with, um, no offense, but a group of freshmen Yeah. Uh. because my seniors were, I was done with my classes for the day and we, we kept like reloading and reloading and, um, and freshmen I, tend to get excited uh, about everything. And they had no idea what was going on and I was, you know, be quiet. And they're all like, ah, <laughs> this is important. It was crazy. <laughs> but yeah, I, re I, I remember what happened and, um, I was a a uh, advocate for Cardinal Dolan. Oh yeah, and I knew it was a long shot, but I I wanted so bad for those 
you know, the curtains, the curtains depart. depart. And there he would be just laughing, you know, <laughs> his belly laughing. And it wasn't. So when I saw and I, I didn't know about, you know, Cardinal Bergoglio. I didn't know about him. And so when he came out, I was like, hmm. hmm. Who's that? Hmm. <laughs> yeah. Well, father and I were who's also. That guy? That's yeah. Who's that guy? Here comes the guy. Tell me who he is. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, it, it, whenever, whenever he came out on the loggia, uh, of course, Father Ryan and I, as you say, we were coming back from Austin. So that means that we were at the mercy of our nation's, uh, data uh. network, cellular data network. But my new Android phone with its gigantic screen performed like a pro picking up LTE outside of Houston, <laughs> Texas. It, it did. It did. And it was great. It was, I mean, it, 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 we, it, Father Chris had my phone and his phone next to each other. And they were, we kept switching the Bluetooth audio between his and mine so we could hear in the car. Mm -hmm. And uh, back and forth and back and forth. And uh, we missed the actual second when the, uh, when the curtains opened, but we very, very quickly were able to connect again. And it was buffering. Yeah. It was buffering. Yeah. yeah. But it really was surprising. Uh, that, that I think almost is an image of, of what we at the Catholic Underground have been about since our inception. The fact that now, through a cellular device, you and I were watching the, the election and the beginning of the reign of Pope Francis. I, it still kind of sends chills down my mm -hmm. spine when I think about it, that, that this, is, this is the power now of, of social communications and digital media. It, it's true. It's absolutely true. I mean, it's it's not the kind of thing where you have to read it in a letter from a relative or in a newspaper or even hear it on the radio. It's the kind of thing where you, we're seeing yeah. what millions and millions of other people are seeing and getting it from dozens of perspectives. Um, and and for better or worse, being able to choose our particular ideological slant sure. as, it, as it's explained to us. And it was fascinating. That's right. Thankfully, all of the ideological slants, uh, because it was such a surprise uh, they all kind of picked from the same pool, you know, um, even yeah. even some of the, the, the folks that we would say, I'm not really sure if I would trust their coverage. Yeah. They had some actually very good names that were uh, that right. were that were uh, there in uh, kind of in the, the bird's eye view of what was going on. And I imagine a lot of it was kind of like when Pope John Paul II was elected. This was somebody completely out of the left field. Nobody had any idea who he was, you know, that. Clearly, nowadays they had some package on everybody in the in the conclave. Yeah. But clearly, Bergoglio was not one of the ones that that they had a significant package on because when they went, that guy, yeah, <laughs> great. And and I'm sure. I mean, quickly pictures came up. Sure, great. But I mean, nobody yeah. had any idea what to say. Yeah. Um. And everybody was just going, well, he's from somewhere in South America, first <laughs> South America. But there we go. We can run with that. That's right. We'll say that for an hour now. Yeah. Yeah, that that poor little intern, who uh, whose whose one job was to get coffee and look up Bergoglio's picture, mm -hmm. he was really proud that day. Yep. Go, he go. He might have had a coffee for himself. <laughs> 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 Kathleen, you were gonna say? No, I I think it's just interesting how you know I remember when he came out and there's so many you know um, pictures online about you know John Paul II and then and then Benedict and there they come out and then there's. Francis. Mm -hmm. Hey. Hi. Hi, y'all. Yeah, and it's so interesting because when he did that, I remember thinking like, oh, He's man. He's shell-shocked. What are we getting? This yeah. guy's going to be like a dud. Like, <laughs> dude, you have to come come on. And then the next morning, I, you know, I went to bed that night and I was like, okay, this is it. Change is a coming, my friends. Mm -hmm. And I woke up the next morning and I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But, yeah. but remember there when he are. asked us to pray with him? That was yeah. so great. Yeah. I mean, I... I was excited. I may have been the one person in the free world who was excited that he was a Jesuit. But uh, <laughs> but when he said, let's all pray together, I said, oh, I'm digging it. Uh, yeah. I'm digging yeah. it. Yeah, it was really surprising. You know, it, 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 that's when I started to question going, okay, what, what are we in for? Mm -hmm. And then the next day, whenever he had mass in the Sistine Chapel um, at the close, for closing the conclave, yeah. and, uh, and poor Monsignor Marini is, is putting the binder out with his notes, the, the prepared homily that they have for whoever gets elected. Mm -hmm. And he just kind of, he's, he's standing there and he, he closes the binder <laughs> while he's still looking at everybody and just kind of shoves it off and <laughs> just starts speaking. I was like, oh my, all right. Here we go. <laughs> and, and it was off and running. And, uh, and so Pope Francis has done a lot of things differently, but uh, as we're learning, he is 100% Catholic. And and that is uh, that that is that's a beautiful thing to realize that the um, the continuity of the faith goes on uh, even if it does so in a different key. 
Mm. And that's one of the great gifts that Pope Francis has given us is we're, we're beginning to kind of hum in a, in perhaps a, a new key, but it's still in harmony with, with the church. And uh, so that was, that's, that's our number one, I suppose, of the, of the 10 top stories. But I guess if we're going to get through them all, we better get moving. You're listening to The Catholic Underground. We are online at catholicunderground.tv. I'm Father Chris Decker. Father Ryan Humphreys joins us on Skype. We've got Kathleen Lee and Mary Kate Taylor. This week, we're looking back at the top stories of 2013. From a Faith Meets Tech point of view, our picks of the week are in a little while. But uh, first of all, we move to our next story. And this is something that I've actually had the opportunity to witness close up. And it is the phenomenon of 3D printing. Have you seen it? You have a 3D printer at... Uh, we do. We have at a 3D printer at, uh, at the school I teach at, St. Mm-hmm. Joseph's Academy. And, and the girls have... Do they um, do stuff on oh it? Oh, yeah. They, they've they printed a whole student, like, chess piece. Like chess oh, a chess board. Board. But, like, of students. Oh, like, with their faces? No, no, no Of their whole bodies. That's weird. I mean, they're very small. But... Who, who gets to play the bishop? Uh, uh. <laughs> Don't answer that. Mm. But yeah, they in, they do things from you know they have a whole you know menagerie of of things. I think they they just printed some of this because we have a beautiful shield. Uh, I think they just printed some shields to give out as Christmas. Oh, ornaments. that's cool. I have yeah. I have in my computer bag here um, a couple of three D printed objects. Ooh, as a matter yes. of fact, yeah. So if you're watching us on the stream, good for you. I just have to find. Hold on, here it is. This is one. Like it was Santa actually, a th- I know, oh, I am Santa Claus. Look at my things here <laughs> that I have for you. Um, this is a 3D printed uh, um, Celtic cross, mm-hmm. and it was actually a scan, uh, a 3D scan of another object, and it put it together and it printed it on the 3D printer. Um, if, you're, if you're listening to us, it's, uh, it's about, I don't know, about maybe an two inches high. And, uh, yeah, and that's it's like four. That's like is four. it four? I'm not really good with that. Um, if it were yards, I'd be okay. Um, and uh, it's it's green, mm-hmm. the color of Celtic crosses, right? And uh, it looks, it's got almost all of the detail that you can see on it. So that's uh, that's one of the things that I have. I think I may have the other one. Yeah. Yeah, if I can. It is. It is a 3D printed chain link. It's purple. And when it printed the deal, I watched it while it was 3D printing. It printed it linked together already. Yeah. You can You can hear it. There. Hmm. So those are those are my 3D printed objects that I received from a friend who has a 3D printer uh, in our library system. Hmm. And we talked about it a couple episodes ago. So 3D printing, Father Ryan, this this is something because I feel like we're not very far away from uh, from having Jean-Luc Picard's artificial heart. Hmm. Well, I mean, that's the, the the two big things that have come out of the, of the 3D printing that have made noise. I mean, of course, it's cool. It's a really cool technology. But the things that have come out are, one, biomedical tech. There's actually yeah. been an effort to, and they've actually printed most of a kidney. Um, and, and they were able to get it working for a few minutes. Yeah, you know, that's using, something. Using a, a variation on 3D printing, which is astounding. Mm-hmm. And, of course, the other thing that's caused people to get rough, uh, ruffled is guns. Yeah. yeah. You know, you, pre, you, you can print a gun um, that ha- where every, basically everything in it is plastic except uh, the, the firing pin. Yeah. And so you have this kind of thing that you could theoretically bring a 3D printer into some kind of secure environment and print a gun, or you could, you know, have have a, a gun where all you'd have to sneak in and is a tiny little piece of metal. And that, of course, freaks people out for good reason. Sure. Um, but I think the thing that's most exciting is the biomedical tech, the idea that, that we're really in a position where we can help people um, with all sorts of things. Of course, this is going to be abused and misused. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it's it's been a banner year for this particular technology. Very very exciting. And apparently in the chat room, uh, Jurassic Park three has a Velociraptor resonating chamber, which I can only imagine is is quite a piece of tech. You know, I have to be honest with you, Dom Cobb in the chat. I haven't seen Jurassic Park three. I stopped it too. Yeah, I, smart move. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I somehow think yeah. that if uh, Michael Crichton didn't write a book about it. I'm probably not going to watch the movie. I I only um I only kind of laughingly watched Jurassic Park two, mm-hmm. because the Lost World, of course, was a book. Uh, uh, but but you can't you can't miss out on Jeff Goldblum being Jeff Goldblum. That really was the reason I watched you. You Jeff you've Goldblum as Jeff Goldblum. That's right. He only plays the one character. Yeah, that's true. If you've seen uh, Buckaroo Banzai across the eighth dimension, fourth I can't remember which it is, but uh, Bu- uh, Buckaroo Banzai is this kind of uh, rock star physicist. Mm-hmm. 
and Jeff Goldblum's in it, and he plays only slightly younger Jeff Goldblum. <laughs> well, he's the same in Independence Day, too. That's right. In fact, they wanted him to be the guy in Jurassic Park for Independence Day. That's what they wanted. That's the character they wanted. Do you think, Father Ryan, we could 3D print a Jeff Goldblum one day? I don't know if you can get the franticness of it, but it would be awesome. It's true. Uh, in the chat, it says uh, Jurassic Park 3 is pretty brutal and terrible. See? Yeah. that's There you go. Right. Whenever Mystery Science Theater 3000 uh, treats it, I'll watch. Yeah. Yes. So, is there anything else in the realm of 3D printing that um, that that you were excited about? Maybe anything with with tech with computers? Only in only the degree that it it, if it becomes more sophisticated, we may actually be in a position to be able to print circuit boards Mm. more efficiently than we're doing now. Oh yeah, Um, and that's cool. But I mean, I think it's like Dom Cobb says: the actual ability to take like a fossil, a fossilized thing and print the resonating chamber of a velociraptor so we can shoot air through it and see what a velociraptor would sound like. Yeah. That's fascinating. And, uh, but for me, I'm, I'm really excited about the biomedical applications because that, that's real value. That's what right. We're doing. It may save our life one day. It may. You never know. And then, of course, uh, kind of connected to 3D printing in a sense is uh, the fact that uh, we're beginning to wear our technology. Uh, I know uh, Fitbits are very popular. I wish I hadn't washed mine. I might have to you know, make an appeal for a Christmas gift for a new Fitbit. <laughs> but uh, but all these ni- ideas of, of wearable tech and, of course, the Google Glass and things like that, That's that actually, this was the first year that we began to witness that in the mainstream, right? Right. Wearable computing really became a thing. Now, before we had had, you know, little Fitbit thing it plugs on. We had appliances. Remember, we always had appliances. Yeah. You had a GPS device. You had a camera. You had a video camera. It's the only reason you'd wear a fanny pack. Oh, fanny pack. <laughs> you know the rules, the rules, Kathleen. Yeah. No fanny pack. Uh, but, but I mean, it was, it was a year where the phones, uh, thank you, thanks to the Moto X and the iPhone, uh, the, the i7, pro, not the i7, but the processor in the new iPhone 5, the A7. Uh, that was, was able to, to really start doing meaningful um, uh, tech, or I should say fitness within the tech, being able to keep up with your steps, being able to keep up with where you're going, how much activity you have. Uh, it was a fascinating year, and of course, Google Glass was amazing. Mm-hmm. The the steps forward that were made by all of the different fuel band type things, the Samsung Watch, the the rumors of the iWatch, the Pebble. Uh, it was a year where we're really trying to say that the phone is going to become our new hub of our digital existence, and that stuff is going to be an appliance of the phone instead of the phone being an appliance of your laptop. Right, and and that I think is probably the most revolutionary thing, which means, of course, that our smartphones are here to stay. And, yeah, absolutely, and, and, and then they're, they're going to become the center of everything. Yeah, in in ways that we haven't even thought about yet. And it's really something to think that that processor that's sitting in my pocket mm-hmm. is is almost more powerful than my computer, and so the the amount of processing that that little computer in my pocket can do. Is it really can run so many different types of technology. The only thing I think we have to worry about now, Father, is uh, how we power it, right? Right, and I, I was thinking about that this morning. We, we're almost to the, the point where we can power the thing all day. And yeah. really, it'd be, it's, it's, it's meaningless over the 14-hour point. Right. Once, once you get where you can get up in the morning, run it all day, and it doesn't, you're not going to have any issue about, you know, before you go to bed running out of power, then that, that's it. We're done. Um, mm-hmm. And so it's very exciting because we're at the ten and a half to eleven hour point right now. Yeah, that's right. Your uh, your Apple device, your um, uh, MacBook Air, gets what ten hours? Yeah, but your phone gets that. Your your phone is going to get ten to to eleven hours of heavy use right now. You know, come to think of it, I actually whenever I, the end of my day, because I'm now an iPhone 5s user, I I use as you can imagine, I use my phone heavily mm-hmm. throughout the day. And it's it's maybe at forty percent by the end of the day w- without a charge. That's true. I hadn't thought of that. Really? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not too shabby. I'm still on the four S. Right, well, but and and that was a good phone until you tried to put iOS seven on it. Yeah. Yeah. I resisted. Look, Father Chris knows I resisted. She did until that dang little red dot showed up with the one update, and then I resisted a lot longer. Yeah, she even had a beret. I mean, she was part of, like, the iOS 7 resistance. She wouldn't do it. And then it wore me down. It did. That's right. That little I can't stand having little... little that little badge? Badge. As Father Ryan can tell you, it doesn't bother me all that much. <laughs> you can turn the badge off. I should have mentioned that to you. What? <laughs> oh, man. 
There it is. <laughs> Settings, <laughs> notifications. Just turn badges off. <laughs> but you could do that now, and it won't eat as much power <laughs> or computing. <laughs> Sorry, Kathleen. This is a bad day. Is that bad? <laughs> yes. yes, that's bad. Do, 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 do. That's true. Yeah, and so oh. um, all that to say, I'm I'm excited to see where wearable fitness tech goes. In fact, we even have Google Glass users that are that are aiming for some sort of like civil rights movement on being able to wear their their Google Glass in restaurants and other places that would find it um, a, a little gauche. And so they're getting yeah, I, mad. I've been I've been filing also uh, amicus briefs, friend of the court briefs, to allow me to punch those people in the nose. Yeah, uh, but so far true. I've gotten very little. Uh, yeah, positive feedback. That's too bad. Because sometimes, well, they're expensive. Maybe that's why. That's fifteen hundred dollars a pop. Yeah, quite, quite literally also, a pop. We're just not there. <laughs> I mean, in a certain sense, it's so comically silly. Yeah. You look at Google Glass and you say, "This is obviously an interim product." Right. You know, it's not right. it's the big, real it's thing. It's clunky. Yeah. I mean, you know, ultimately it's tragic, but we're basically waiting for the Jordy LaForge contact lens. Right. You know, kind of thing, and that's probably only about eight or ten years away. But that's really what we're waiting. I'm waiting for my own personal uh, assistant named Reginald Barkley. who will just follow me around. Reg. And, yeah. Kathleen, you don't know any of that, do you? Why you got to, hey, you could have just gone on with <laughs> oh, the Oh, sorry, show. sorry. I mean, nobody would have known. Way to go, up. Kathleen. You got it. <laughs> Damn. Yeah, there you go. Uh, okay. Um, the next one has absolutely nothing to do with 3D printing, we think. Um, it might have something to do with cloning. Um, <laughs> the, the goody two shoes pop stars that have gone to the dark side. Um, in fact, I'm, I'm just looking at the list that we have here, Father Ryan, and a lot of them are actually clones of the Disney Empire. They really are. This is actually, people will laugh, but I gave my sermon for Gaudete Sunday with this exact article. I start off by talking about how the uh, so many of our, our pop stars who were, and some of them were kind of role model sort of figures, have, have just abandoned all efforts and have gone full on, thrown their innocence out the door for no apparent gain. No. I mean, uh, of course, Amanda Bynes had her nervous breakdown at the beginning of the year. She was a Nickelodeon star. She was yes. Nickelodeon, and and she had done some more questionable roles. She was in Hairspray, and she was in um, uh, was that movie called Dogma? No, no, um, uh, no. You, Be Saved, Camp Jesus, whatever that one was called. So she was in a couple mm. of movies that were you know a little less kosher. Taylor Swift, of course, went from being the sweet girl next door who liked to dress up in pretty dresses to the girl who couldn't get enough skin tight shorts. Yeah. Um, and has really kind of made efforts to shed any innocence that she had. Yeah, maybe we um, should pause there for a moment, Father, because you were a Taylor Swiftite for a while. I was. I really enjoyed. I was really enamored of the shows that she did because mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I love kind of Broadway entertainment. I love musical theater. Yeah. And the shows that she did, the first two concert series, were really about a theatrical experience. There were there were interstitials. There were. Uh, there was a soft shoe. There was tap dancing. There was aerial acrobatics. There was uh, all manner of things. And all the songs kind of flowed in a narrative from the beginning to the end. And you got done and you said, this was great. And you didn't say encore because you said this, the show was over. That's that right. was the yeah, show. You, you took me somewhere. It's right. It went mm -hmm. from point A to point B. And it was lovely. And, it, and you felt like, that's great. And I really felt like I had been to see something off Broadway. Mm -hmm. And um, I went and saw the the new show, the Red Show, which I figured would be a little more mature, a little more adult. But whoa, it was rancid. There was it was a series of completely disconnected musical numbers, you know, akin to like uh, I don't even know what is akin to. And there was no real narrative. Uh, there was it was just a very very. A gauche kind of show. It didn't have any real sense of that beauty or simplicity or or even the joy. It was just her trying to look like an adult, uh -huh. and um and it was sad. I mean, I I yeah. got to the end of it and I felt grossly disappointed. I felt very unhappy, and really, I've I've not enjoyed Taylor Swift's music very much since then. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and I think that I and of course I'm not the the target for that audience, but it just wasn't good. It just was not. It was very, very unimpressive. Yeah, and that's a sad thing. Whenever, um, and this happens very often in in the public eye. Whenever a a pop star or a rock star or an actor or an actress uh, go through their issues and try and sort them out in front of an audience, yeah, and that's it's so sad to watch. I mean, uh, the next one on the list of uh, Vanessa Hudgens uh, of of High School Musical fame, right? She and and Selena Gomez from uh, from the Disney Channel both. Uh, you know, in an effort to kind of shed their their 
innocence because both of them had tried to launch a music career and both of them had done so with kind of a, a cutesy kind of Hannah Montana feel and mm-hmm. neither of them had really gone anywhere. And um, the two of them got together and, and with, did a movie that was basically softcore pornography. There's no other way yeah. to describe it called Spring Breakers. And the entire, and the, the movie from what I understand, I haven't seen it, was just terrible. It was an excuse to dress like skanks, to talk about sex a lot, to do drugs, um, and basically as a, as a project to shed any innocence that they might have had. Yeah, and that's the sad thing, too, is while they're working out their issues with a script in front of them, um, we actually are enticed to watch. And, and that, uh, that, that voyeurism is, is really such a sad thing. You know, while, while we're urged by St. Paul to work out our salvation in fear and trembling, it's with great sadness that we watch folks not working out their salvation, but working out their own destruction. And, and of course, our culture likes that, doesn't it? Oh, we love to watch someone collapse on themselves. Yeah. Um, Kathleen, were you a fan of, uh, of, of any of the, the ones we've mentioned thus far? Um, you know, I was, al- I, I w- yes. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. I was always a fan of Taylor Swift, her music. I, you know, Father Ryan and I have talked about this before, but I never really liked her shows. Um, but I always thought that they were good, you know, they weren't mm-hmm. something that I was like, ew, that's not even entertainment. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, all of these, it's just sad. And especially talking to the girls, you know, um, at, at my school, just about what they watch, who they idolize, you know, they, they yeah, just you've have got the inside track. Uh, do they actually, do they pick up on all the faults here or are they just kind of ride along with it? Well, it's interesting that, uh, we were talking the other day about how Miley Cyrus was up for person of times, person of the year. And as mm-hmm. was um, Pope Francis, who ultimately won, you know, and we had a, a conversation in my class just about what we view as entertainment. They're like, oh, she's an artist. And I was like, mm. no, she she was. I really think that these that these people have great talent. These you girls should have- read to with your girls read John Paul II's letter to artists with them. Ooh. That would be mm, good. Yeah. That would be. Merry Christmas. But they all are like they, they all have incredible talent. You yeah. know, it's just that they they have. Um, someone in their life, unfortunately, who is telling them, do this, this will be the right move. And, yeah. and unfortunately, when they're all, you know, in rehab or, right. or you know, or on the doctor's couch, mm-hmm. you know, Trying working to work through their out. issues, yeah. those people are going to be on the beach, you know, be- because they have been, been yeah. profiting. And that's really, their, it's their not even downfall. peer pressure. It's not even peer yeah. pressure. It's it's the pressure of the record label yeah. or of uh, of the, the movie house. Yeah, you know that that's causing this because we 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 realize, and this is why Disney, perhaps, and and uh, Nickelodeon create all of these worlds for for especially I notice with with young women to live in. They create these universes, mm-hmm. and you're thinking, oh well, they want to they want to tell us some some uh, life application stories, and and that's what television used to be about. Yeah, but now it's no no. We're going to create some things, and you may get some um, some sort of you know, end of the fable, a moral to it, but eventually we're going to cut them loose and make them into little money-making yeah. objects, and and that's really really sad. Well, and what's, you know, what's, what's really sad about these women is if they will, you know, swear up and down that they are liberated and they are strong and they are, mm-hmm. you know, this, and I'm like, no, you're not. Like, no, this isn't liberation. This isn't freedom. This isn't. That's right. Strength. That's actually connected to um to to what Pope Francis said today, Father, and you know where I'm going. Oh yeah. Uh, he was he was interviewed again, mm-hmm. and um, the the interviewer asked him the question: Can I ask you? Do you think that we will see women cardinals? Yeah. And Pope Francis, uh, probably in a in a very shocking sense, right? Because people are starting to to uh, try and politicize him yeah. as they do with mm-hmm. every pontiff. He said, "Well, um, I, I think actually we don't need to to cardinalize women." Because that uh, we need to respect them and not clericalize them. Wow. We need to respect women and not clericalize them. He says, in fact, I think the people who want women cardinals are actually little clericalists themselves. Hmm. Which, Father, that was, I had a bit of a think after that. Oh, I did too. I mean, it was, it was a, a serious, because it's the kind of thing that's easy to say, aha, you see, somebody I agree with. Uh, but, but it was such a, an, an outstanding kind of moment of, you know, think it is almost Chestertonian. Yeah. Think about what you're saying, you know, stop just saying it and think about it. Yeah. And that's, and that's exactly what, uh, what, what's going on. If, if we could get some of our, our pop stars to just perhaps go on a retreat and to think, and then of course, Miley Cyrus, we have Miley Cyrus. We can't yeah, I mean, not mention her. 
yeah. right? And, and she's kind of the one who who is completely falling off. But you know what I, I preached about was how incredibly unscandalous yeah. and unshocking it was. I mean, because, you know, you go back and you think, well, Marilyn Monroe was really shocking. You know, yeah. she had done this kind of incredibly sexualized thing, and that was new. It was something people hadn't seen before. And Madonna did some things that were new with this kind of very uh, different kind of stage show and kind of music that was a lot more aggressively sexual than women had sung before. Right. And even Lady Gaga, you know, mm-hmm. as a shock artist, did yeah. things that were shocking. But Miley Cyrus didn't do anything that we didn't see in Dirty Dancing in the 80s. Right. Um, it was just so uninspired and almost boring. Mm-hmm. And yet, yeah. you know, it, it's 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 like why would you why would you trade yourself for just a handful of moments? And you could tell. I mean, the poor girl, you know, she's she's trends on Twitter, but then everybody goes, "Well, I'm bored now," and goes to something else. And so she feels like she has to do something more and more and more radical. But there's really nothing more radical for her to do. She right. sold yeah. any sense of of shockability yeah. that she has. Now there's she's basically just an empty shell, and it's it really is a tragedy. And of course, it's a tragedy too for all those young Hannah Montana girls, right? Who who are looking and saying, "Well, I guess this is the only way to get attention is basically right. to sell everything I have and just give give what little I have away." And that's yeah. just mm-hmm. tragic, mm-hmm. And, and not in a way that that brings virtue, but in a or way happiness. that actually or happiness, yeah, but in a way that empties you, um, in in where you can't find fulfillment. You know, Miley, honey, what I would suggest for you is to just cash out, take the money. Go find Jesus again, because I'm pretty sure you knew him. You were from a good country family. <laughs> and I think things will be okay. All right? Good. You are indeed listening to the 2013 Year in Review on the Catholic Underground. I'm Father Chris Decker. Kathleen Lee's over there. Father Ryan Humphreys joins us. And, of course, we've got Mary-Kate Taylor in the vid cave. And we move on. You know, not all the things in 2013 um, were were newsworthy in the sense that they brought lightness to our hearts or even question marks to our head. But uh, there really was some tragedy as well. Absolutely. And, uh, and we, we look, of course, at the shootings um, in Sandy Hook. Mm-hmm. We look at uh, the, uh, the shootings in the movie theater. Um, in Aurora, Colorado, the Boston Marathon bombing, and then even as recently as a few days ago, um, we saw another uh, attempted um, uh, massacre in a school. And um, it really does make us question, Father, what what is going on? Because I know a lot of a lot of times, whenever things like this happen, you have young people that that have guns and they go and they they massacre folks. Um, we begin looking at video games again. That always kind of pops up. And uh, we begin looking at, at these uh, movies that are rated R, but somehow kids manage to let their parents get them to see them, you know. Mm-hmm. And is there, do you think there's some connection with this? Or is it just in the same thing we were talking about in the previous segment, kids looking for, for something and yeah. trying to find it in themselves? Well, I think that the thing, one of the things we really ignore is that poverty is as high as it's been since the Great Depression. Mm-hmm. Joblessness is as high as it's been, really, in the history of our country. Um, and the the constant rhetoric coming from everybody in politics, right, left, and center, yeah. is angry and and looking for somebody else to blame. Mm-hmm. And it's it's a deeply entitled mentality that a lot of our kids have of, well, your job is to give me stuff, and my job is simply to take it. Yeah. And and all of those things tend to create a, a perfect storm where you don't really need to, to blame anything. You don't need to blame gun control or lack thereof. You don't need to blame video games. You just have a bunch of bored people yeah. who, who can't afford to do what they want to do, who feel like the world is out to get them, and who have been trained they're supposed to blame somebody else, and, frankly, who watch Miley Cyrus in the crowd and say, you know, attention is always a good thing, right? Because you know, we we don't really show the 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 difficulties and the trials of prison life on TV. We have Orange Is the New Black convincing us it's really not that bad, right? And uh, you know, and so I think a lot of those things come together to to form a, a very very bad environment um, yeah. that is is conducive to people going, well, you know, why not? Let's just see what happens. And, and then, of course, one of the things that, that we can't fail to mention is the reality of spiritual warfare in all of this. You know, of course. We, 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 we speak about it all the time that we battle the three things, right? We battle our own disordered will. 
we battle the spirit of the world and we battle Satan himself. And so if if I'm battling my own will or I have I have decided to not battle anymore, I have decided to not uh, seek any sort of mastery over my own will. If if I have bought into the spirit of the world, like sadly so many of these these young women um, that we talked about have or appear to have, then really there's only one other personage, and he's a fallen angel, and he can just move right in. And so it's not surprising to me whenever we we look back on things like Sandy Hook and we we look back on. Um, even the Boston Marathon bombing, and there are some questions, and we as a, an enlightened society, so to speak, uh, say, oh, well, they were mentally unstable. But if you look at some of the things that, that uh, were in their journals and things of that nature, uh, maybe some of the things that they said, um, that's not the work of somebody who is mentally unstable. It's the work of somebody who is spiritually unstable because their lot has been thrown in with the one who is not God. And, of course, then that gets played out in a psychological way. Right. And there it is. There you go. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, we move on to other things happening within the world. Um, President Morsi is, uh, is ousted in Egypt. That is what began, I suppose, we call the, uh, the, the Arab springtime. Huh? Um, and I find it interesting, Father, that we use that term because in the Catholic Church, we talk about the new springtime of faith, and yet that that uh, term Arabic Spring has also been used. Well, and I think in large part because Islam, you know, is 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 growing and having a, a kind of a springtime of its own, and uh, Islam is the is the faith slash political system that has taken over quite a lot of the countries in the Middle East. Yes, you know, and and they are uh, as evangelical as any Christian, perhaps more so, and uh, you know, so, I mean, a, a springtime seems like the right term, mm-hmm. although. Springtime has connotations of happiness and goodness, and of course, in the eye of the beholder, yeah. you know it is good for them. Um, it's difficult for Christianity because Christianity has the the benefit of the long point of view, right? And and Islam is is fairly young. Well, it is. It's about six hundred years younger than Christianity, but but we also know that that it's a false system. You know, right. it's it's a it's a it's a false thing, um, and. You know, when Islam is taken radically, it 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 almost inevitably goes toward extreme violence, which right. is something that is not just anti-faith but anti-human. Exactly, and and so that's uh, one of the things that I would imagine in 2014 we will keep an eye on um, is how how faith plays a part in the life of the Christian, of the Muslim, of the Jew, and uh, as we're seeing increasingly, even of the atheist or the agnostic. Uh, that's becoming more and more of an issue as as faith is kind of on the table in the courtroom and in the Supreme Court. And so, um, and so yes, we, we certainly look at that. Of course, um, one of the things that also is happening is right now, as you're watching this or listening to it, the boys in Washington or in Langley are as well. Uh, we learned this year that the NSA is in fact spying on us, right, Father? Right. We learned with Edward Snowden, with Bradley Manning, and of course with WikiLeaks, that the NSA is uh, is spying domestically. That drones are spying on us domestically. That lots and lots and lots of illegal wiretaps are taking place, and that all of the digital traffic, which is basically all the traffic, um, mm-hmm. is being uh, you know is being scanned. And of course, we don't believe that there's somebody sitting in a room listening to every conversation we have on the phone. But um, I actually have a friend who works for the government who likes to to mess with them sometimes where he'll call his wife and they'll just be having a regular conversation. He goes, well, I got to do this. And he'll just start saying certain words that he <laughs> knows are going to be flagged. And after he says about 13 of them, he counts the number and he'll get to about 10, 12, 13. And all of a sudden the phone call just drop out. Uh, and he says, <laughs> cause he thinks it's funny because that's when you reach a certain number of, uh, of, of code of, words. Yeah. A certain number of flag terms, you know? It, and so it's, it's, it's terrifying. And yet here we are making jokes about it because we've gotten used to being in a police state. It's kind of like, you know, it, we're frogs in, in slowly boiling water. It's That's really right. quite terrifying that this is happening, and we're just kind of, you know, laughing about it. If I may make a plug, uh, Michael O'Brien's new book, Voyage to Alpha Centauri, it's in there. Um, what happens when a culture becomes just so okay with, um, with surveillance mm-hmm. and, um, and, and who actually watches the watchers? Uh, really good. Do you have the book yet, Father? No, I haven't gotten it. I'm I'm reading a book about education because I have some ongoing formation to do at my Catholic school. But uh, 
it's uh, it's on my list. I highly recommend it. Um, and then, of course, um, we, we can't not mention this. As you know, we don't talk about politics very, very often. But uh, the Affordable Care Hack, uh, <laughs> hack. The Affordable Care <laughs> Act is neither affordable nor care nor an act. Discuss. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the, uh, the Supreme Court, I believe, if I'm correct, Father, you'll have to correct me on this. Uh, the Supreme Court says, yeah, it's, 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 you can do it, Mr. President. But well, the Supreme Court said that you can, they can require people to buy, to buy insurance, to buy a product, yeah, uh, and that they can, they can provide, um, they can tax or pen, penalize someone for not buying it, which is actually the big question. Yeah, and of course that question is being presented to the Supreme Court again uh, this year, and in June of 2014, uh, the Supreme Court will rule again on a different aspect of individual decision, which could throw the entire Obamacare out again so it's just a, it's a big question but this of course is the time of the implementation healthcare.gov has been a an epic disaster it's caused <laughs> huge approval ratings for, i often uh, think our, of our of our buddy josh leblanc and of, of <laughs> daniel kettinger of, of catholic underground fame um and how and even you father how we could redesign this website in about three ruby on rails commands that's right i mean it's three or four lines of code of course they said what is it it's a half million lines of code yeah must I mean, have, good lord! Must have been done in ASP. Grab an grab an uh, an, uh, an Oracle database. You drop in a handful of code, and bam! It's mm -hmm. nothing. I mean, geez, Louise. Yeah, exactly. And then, of course, uh, our our president's approval ratings are are not exactly at, at an all time high because of this and other things. Right. It's it. It seems like everybody who's who's touched uh, the the Obamacare is is running for the hills, and that their approval is through the floor, and it's bad. And of course, from our point of view, religious. Freedom is, is in decline because of this, and that's it's a big problem. Very, that's right. very big problem. Yeah, which, of course, is is the reason that 2014 will also be uh, a time to watch in seeing what uh, what happens whenever we, we stand up. Because, Father Ryan, we also know that even in the midst of all of this uh, Affordable Care Act stuff, uh, the abortion industry has taken a hit as states have finally stood up and says, no, this isn't right, as the church continues to stand up and say, no, we're not for this. And so we've seen some bans, haven't we, on abortion? Right. The states have, have you know, felt like Obamacare was an overstep for them. And, uh, and so a lot of the states, not just the, the more conservative-leaning ones, but some of the more moderate and even some liberal states have stepped up and have insisted that Planned Parenthood follow the same rules as any other medical clinic, and that's caused massive closures for Planned Parenthood facilities, and also uh, fairly fairly dramatic bans of abortion in many cases uh, after 20 weeks, after 18 weeks, and that's that's going to save a lot of lives. And so, you know, th there could be some good that's come out of this as people have finally stood up and said, no more, no more. And Kathleen, you're active in, uh, in the pro-life movement, and this has been a very good thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, anytime, you know, of course we're looking for a complete ban all across, across the board, the, yeah, yeah, across the board. But any step that that you know we can we can get, we'll take. Yeah, and that's the thing. The, the gradualism in that sense um, it, it can be a good thing. The the slow kind of march through yeah. examining. Uh, okay, if I have to show you how this is bad, mm -hmm. how this doesn't work, then then we'll we'll plod through that. Yeah, well, it's the pendulum swing. Like we've gotten to the. And it's like, oh, it's like the roller coaster. You yeah. get up to the top, like, click, 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 and you're about to go over. That's and, what it is, I feel like, right we're now. We're at the click. Mm -hmm. Still clicking. Click, <laughs> click. <laughs> In her sleep, Kathleen yeah. clicks. That's mm -hmm. right. And then, of course, uh, we, we can't uh, end our look back at, um, at our year without our number 10, which is the 50th anniversary of the Second Vatican Council and the conclusion of the Year of Faith. Now, if you might be asking yourself, well, what was the year of faith? Um, a lot of us are kind of scratching our heads asking ourselves that because, well, something happened in February that changed everything, right? We had the, the resignation of John, of John Paul II, golly, of Benedict XVI. <laughs> I'm about three weeks behind everybody. Uh, and, then, and then, of course, uh, the year of faith that was begun, not three or four months before, kind of got washed under the, uh, the rug, didn't it? Yeah, the, the year of faith was which could have been a really good thing, and I think some for some places really was a good thing. Uh, those places that really took the idea and ran with it, sure. Uh, but but an awful lot of of you know popery, you know, mm -hmm. got involved, and there was just you know for for it, certainly in my diocese, it really did end with a thud. It was just well, your faith is over, but you know, yeah. it, it was the anniversary, the fiftieth anniversary of Vatican II, and I think a lot of good scholarship 
has started to take place in this year, even if at the local parish level, the year of faith was a dud, uh, there were there were huge, huge uh, interest in, in scholarly work and symposia about Vatican II. And of course, we're starting to get enough emotional distance right. where we can discuss the text without saying, well, you don't know what it was like, man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's really important that we not try to, to overly analyze the text with the personal baggage that people felt when it was being written. The Holy Spirit right. didn't inspire the personal baggage, it inspired, the Holy Spirit inspired the text. Right, exactly. And so uh, perhaps the year of faith began some really good ruminations, uh, some very good reflection. And as we know, uh, as the old adage goes, you certainly can't, can't understand any uh, counsel in the first 50 years. But, uh, but we're beginning, as you say, to, to do some of the important work there of getting that done. Uh, so that's, uh, that's our top 10 of, of the year. Uh, let us know what you thought. Maybe we missed something. Backchat at catholicunderground.com is, is the way to do that. And uh, we thought we would take a little bit of time because we don't have a whole lot of it, but well, we can't leave you hanging. It's 2013. And the CU Pick of the Week. Now, last week we gave you our kind of big picks of the year show, but we thought this year, or this, this show, since we had to do some pick of the week for you, um, imagine you're on the Epsilon 9 space station and you have one pick that you could have with you. What would it be? What would it be? One pick from this year. What would it be? Kathleen, I like yours, I think. Well, sometimes I I seem like uh, I sound like a, a simpleton no. amongst, amongst the the great no. minds here. But for those of you who are like me, a Garth Brooks fan, Woo! you do know that just last week he announced a 2014 comeback tour, which I almost fell out of my seat in my office. I bet you literally. did. Actually, there are pictures on Facebook of me reacting to the news story. Mm-hmm. Anyways, he released a six-disc, six-CD, two-DVD box set at Walmart. Oh, I know what you're getting for Christmas. Exclusively, because, I mean, he has that, that deal. Um, but in, in uh, you know, preparation for the biggest tour to ever come. Now, I've missed him twice. Twice, I'll have you know, when he came to Baton Rouge. But not again. Never again. <laughs> this year, I don't even care if I had to fly to Canada. I know people there. That's I'll do true. it. She will. But anyway, if I had to, if I had to be in space forever, mm-hmm. I would, I would imagine, mm-hmm. and it was just me, I could listen to this six, six CD set forever. You know, Kathleen, I don't tell many people this. Yeah. But but my very first foray into popular music uh-huh. was country. It was Garth Brooks, George Strait. That yeah. So good. I even so went through good. kind of a cowboy phase early really? in yeah in in high school with like boots like with with boots and the hat yes. yeah I don't talk about it but there are no pictures <laughs> I think we're all happy about that but I I do like Garth Brooks's music so good yeah so good even when he went through that weird uh, uh, Tobey Maguire and Spider Man three phase yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. well that, yeah it was a, it was a it was for a movie thing. it was for like a movie it was weird. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Uh, Father, are you going to get the uh, the blame it all on my Route 6 CD set? I've got everything Garth Brooks has ever published, and I don't know that I need another set. This, I has, even got new this, mu- this has got new music on it. Oh. Yeah, we'll just see. Just going to throw that out there. <laughs> but I will definitely go to the show. He is one of the best showmen in the world, and I've, That's true. I love a good show. I'm a huge Garth Brooks fan. Woo! I like Beaches of Cheyenne. Oh. You know there are no beaches in Cheyenne. I know. Well, there are, but they're, they're on lakes. That's the whole comedy of it. Ah. It's, yeah. like, it's like a... Oceanfront property in Arizona by Gar- by uh, George Strait. It's just <laughs> that's right. Yeah, uh, Father, you actually uh, now we we should we should say this assumes that we have access to to internet, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I my pick doesn't really work for your spaceship analogy. Uh, in in light of uh, of the death of Google Reader this year, which hurt my heart in a lot of ways, um, because I read an epic quantity of news every day. Um, he does. I recommend uh, as my top pick of the entire year, uh, Feedly as a replacement for Google Reader combined with Pocket, mm-hmm. uh, which I use to grab those articles that I want to really get into and that I can then tag them. I can share directly to Buffer from Pocket. I can share to uh, Facebook or uh, basically anything I want. And so the combination of Feedly and Pocket makes it possible for me to do the research I do to post the stuff I post on the Minor Basilica page. It is Absolutely, uh, I, I, something I recommend for everybody. They both can be gotten for free, and uh, they are really good. Feely.com and getpocket.com. 
And my pick of the week, you're going to laugh, but it's actually a book. It's uh, one I discovered this year. If I were on a space station, there was only one thing that I could have. It would be this book. Thou shalt not use Comic Sans, a designer's almanac of do's and don'ts. Because I would imagine <laughs> that on that space station, somebody would have to design all of the signage. Yep. And so this is uh, 365, so a page for each day of, um, of, of designer do's and don'ts. Things that you should do, things that you shouldn't. And, of course, the first one in the book is Thou Shalt Not Use Comic Sans. And then it goes on from there. And it's actually got some really nice tips for would-be graphic designers on kerning and um, understanding uh, how and why a book or brochure is, is structured the way that it is, um, using smart filters in Photoshop. So that, that's my pick of the year, Thou Shalt Not Use Comic Sans. And uh, I... I, Kathleen, I don't, I don't know. What would you do? You'd probably use that to prop the what door open in your in your cabin. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or become or become the best graphic designer. You could. You see, that's I'm thinking on a Very space deep station. Within. Oh yeah. Yeah, you got that's a dynasty Plenty thing. You got to pass Plenty that down. Time. Would would we all be in the same station together? Hmm. Um, it would be a darn tootin' good time. Yeah, Father Ryan would cook. I would imagine. Hmm. Yes, he would. He would. You know, bake his space flakes or whatever. Space flakes. <laughs> I don't know. My astronaut ice cream. That's right. Your your Weetabix in space. All righty. Well, um, those are our picks of the week. Let us know what your picks of the week are for the year. Back chat at CatholicUnderground dot com. You can tell us on the line. And of course, uh, portions of the Catholic Underground are brought to you by AudibleTrial dot com slash Catholic Underground. That's audibletrial.com slash Catholic Underground. We also, since we're at the end of the year, want to thank you for every bit of benefactoring that you've done over this 2013 year. Uh, we've been able to do some new things because of you. In fact, uh, the next show that you hear from us, we're going to talk a little bit about it. But I want to thank you personally um, from the bottom of my heart uh, as kind of the, the, the face of the organization, if you will, that uh, you've allowed us to do an awful lot since 2006 began. And uh, we're really excited as to where it's going to go. And so uh, thank you very much for, for everything. And you can get more information on how you can continue to help us out at catholicunderground.com. If you want the show notes that accompany this episode and the podcast, if you want to find out more about our apostle and all the things that we do, if you want to find out how to connect with us on Twitter and Facebook, you can head over to catholicunderground.com. You can always watch reruns of our shows at catholicunderground.tv when we're not doing the live show. And of course, uh, we wouldn't be here without you, but we also wouldn't be here without all of those who join us from week to week without fail. And so Father Ryan, his church is online at minorbasilica.org. He's at FR Humphreys on Twitter. Thank you, Father Ryan, for joining us. It's been my pleasure. I promise next year we're going to have video from you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Kathleen Lee. <laughs> she's the faith ninja at Kathleen Y-A-B-R. Thank you, Kathleen, for joining us. Anytime. She was one of the new ones this year. Mary Kate Taylor is an evangelist, and in her spare time, she spins straw into gold. And you know me, I'm Father Chris Decker. You can follow me on Twitter at Digital Catholic. Join us on the interwebs for CatholicUnderground.tv. Thanks for tuning in and hanging out with us on the digital continent. We're CatholicUnderground.com. We're Faith Gone Digital. We will see you next time. From the Catholic Underground.